Good. Well, first of all, a very, very warm welcome to all of you here from IBS. Lovely to see you all on a great sunny day, and I know that each of you, in, in many ways, has been very much part of the, the eldest story, where it's got to, and we very much hope you'll be part of, of the future. So I'm absolutely delighted to, to see you all here. Um, so what I'm going to try to do in my little bit of this opening session is not to talk about um, the latest developments in global technologies and digital technologies and knowledge sharing because I have experts amongst my colleagues here and amongst many of you in the room who can do that much better. But I wanted to take the opportunity just to set the scene a bit in two ways. First of all, where I and colleagues at IDS see the development landscape and some of the bigger challenges that we need to confront around the content of what we're doing, as well as the ways we do it, um, some of the ways that those things are developing and where they're going. So that's a little bit of a context for where digital knowledge sharing fits. I want to say something about challenges of a content side around the digital and some of the ways we're approaching it. And I want to give you a flavour, a little bit, of the IDS context at the moment, in which we are thinking hard about the kinds of questions that Alan raised and which the sub are the subject of this, this meeting. Where is Elvis going? What is the future of digital knowledge sharing? And I thought it might be helpful to, just to share a little bit of where IDS is at at the moment as one of the key partners in, in this area. So I think our kind of context for the way we've been thinking about development in IDS, and I think we all have to come to grips with, is that we are living in a hyper-connected world, and it's a world that's hyper-connected digitally, and technologies are a key part of that. But it's also connected in other ways, in the ways that people move, in the way that microbes move, in the ways that travel happens. We're in a world of flows and quite rapid change. Um, and therefore, a context in which things are much more globally interconnected but in which um, our values, certainly at IDS, and I think for many of us in this room, are also about development as something that has to work for people in places. Um, so new opportunities and challenges to, to make those global and local connections. We've also been, um, in that context, reframing how we're defining development, actually. Um, for a number of decades, and certainly looking back to the moment when Eldis was founded, the focus was very much on poverty reduction, and rightly so. But I think these days, that's not gone away, but we need to be thinking much more about navigating challenges, interconnected challenges that are around things like dealing with inequality, tackling unsustainability, and dealing with insecurity, conflict, risks of various kinds, and I'll say a bit more about each of those in a moment. So it's a world in which things aren't predictable. We're dealing with shocks, surprises, um, at all levels of many kinds. We're also in a world where I think that framing of development as being something that happened in the global south, that kind of old colonial model, has finally and thankfully gone out of the window. I've always questioned whether it was ever relevant, but we know that a lot of aid and development thinking was organised in a kind of north-south paradigm. I think that is increasingly irrelevant, and we're now defining development here as progressive change for everyone everywhere, and thinking about it as being as relevant in, in Brighton as it is in Beijing or Bamako. Um, what's going on in our own backyard and the connections between everybody's backyards and other places are really important, connections between localities. That in turn creates, I think, opportunities and obligations to think about knowledge transfer in a much more multi-directional multi way. Um, I don't think Eldis has ever been about transferring knowledge from the north to the south, and that's been the great strength. It's been about sharing knowledge in multiple directions, but I think abandoning the north-south framework of development really helps one do that. And we need to think about how knowledge can contribute, frankly, not just to incremental, but to quite transformational changes in meeting some of these big challenges. So 
The other context, of course, we're dealing with um, is that of the, the UN Global Goals, Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals. These different terms are, are flying around at the moment. And, of course, this sets out 17 goals to which all countries have signed up. Again, it's a universal framing. Um, and I think we need to consider the roles of knowledge sharing and digital knowledge in relation to all of them, but in relation to the interconnections between them too. One could put the digital into goal nine. It's about innovation and infrastructure, and indeed some of the targets there are about um, building digital infrastructures and the digital knowledge. But actually, um, the opportunities, I think, lie in thinking about knowledge sharing in relation to the content and supporting countries and places to own these agendas and meet these goals. And I think we need to be aware that the SDG agenda is very different from the Millennium Development Goals that have guided most of the last 20 years of, of, of the work of Elvis and others. Partly because it was developed not by a few people in a room in the UN, but by some very inclusive consultation. It is a much more transformational agenda, which integrates planet as well as people. And it focuses in not just on symptoms, but actually on underlying causes. It's far more challenging in that respect. And it's not just about what happens in countries, it's also an aim to invigorate international cooperation on the basis of some of these big challenges. So, the SDG agenda has its cynics and its critics. People say there's too much to do, it's too complicated. I, and I think many colleagues at IDF, share some of the optimism that actually we need to embrace this and see it as an opportunity to shape some really important, more transformational pathways of change. Um, but we also need to, need to guard against risks that actually will end up with siloed approaches to the individual goals and that actually this will sit as a bureaucratic agenda that doesn't really get owned and located in the countries where it matters. We had a big session on local ownership of the SDGs um, in our 50th anniversary conference a couple of months ago and I think this is where, where the challenges really lie in a way that looks at the connections and the synergies and the trade-offs amongst those goals, not just picking them out as individual things that particular ministries or NGOs or institutions will take on. So, how are we engaging with all of this? Well, um, we're doing it in a way that, that brings together the different features and parts of IDS as a centre of academic excellence, as a community of professionals in development, as a mobilizer of knowledge for impact, and that of course is the big focus of, of what Eldis and others have been doing, and also as part of a, a global network of partnerships. But we're increasingly defining the approach we take around this notion of engaged excellence, which, which I will come back to. Um, and this is embodied in a strategy that we launched last year, um, which aligns in quite a lot of ways with the more transformative ambitions of the SDGs, which sets out challenges for us in shaping and supporting the implementation of these goals and of um, tackling global challenges through research and through sharing knowledge, um, and which runs right across the Institute, so through our various research and knowledge clusters, but also through the units who've been involved in developing and delivering services like Elvis over the years, which are now um, defined as our Open Knowledge and Digital Services Unit, our Knowledge Mobilisation and Impact Unit. And we also launched last year a new research cluster on digital and technology, which is trying to ask some of the searching questions that are on the agenda for this couple of days about who gains and who loses, about the opportunities, but also some of the challenges of the digital as the mode in which so much development is now going to be happening. So, We've also set out in our, in our strategy um, what we think are three really big cross-cutting defining challenges of our era. And increasingly, a lot of our work, whether it's in research or whether it's in our knowledge sharing work, is, is kind of orientating itself around some of these. Um, so just to say 
a little, and we've got a few evidence reports which came out last year which have begun to frame some of our, our thinking um, and the thinking of our partners in these areas. So why do these matter? Why do we think these are important? Well, reducing inequalities, I think, now has to join and go along with poverty reduction as, as, as a key global task. The evidence accumulating over the last um, decade or so shows that inequalities are rising everywhere, um, in middle income emerging economies as well as in high income countries of the global north and in some of the more fragile states um, in sub-Saharan Africa. And that um, rising inequalities undo growth and make poverty reduction far more difficult to achieve. We've just been working with the International Social Science Council on the World Social Science Report, which brings together, launches next week, and it's bring to get, brought together a lot of new evidence about why inequalities really matter to everybody. They're not just economic, and we talk in the report about seven different dimensions of inequality. But we also, interestingly, in that report, and it's a theme that relates to the work of our, our digital cluster, are identifying digital inequalities as important inequalities in themselves, part of inequalities in access to and control over knowledge, inequalities in ability to access digital infrastructure, new kinds of digital devices, um, as inequalities in themselves, but also threats to tackling some of these other kinds of inequalities. So we're doing quite a lot of work here, which is untangling mechanisms, causes, consequences, but also thinking what do you do about inequalities? Um, transformative policies, transformative politics and mobilizing for change, and actually transformative knowledge agendas, which can begin to do research and knowledge sharing differently um, in this context. Our second big defining challenge picks up on um, evidence and realities of how climate change but also other environmental challenges are um, interlinked in a number of ways are now affecting people across the world and if we don't um, urgently begin to build transformative approaches towards more sustainable ways of organizing production consumption movement energy other kinds of services um, that frankly the last couple of decades of development will be undone pretty quickly um, so the work of our Green Transformations Cluster, the work of our Resource Politics Cluster have been working with many partners around how we can understand pathways that are leading us in unsustainable directions, but also those that can move us towards sustainability, what are the drivers, what are the blockages, what are the roles and relationships of technologies, of markets, of governments, of citizens in building innovations, in driving pathways of change. And again, I think the digital world really feeds in here um, in opportunities to track and monitor trends, the use of digital data, open data around environmental change, but also ways to share and facilitate the sharing of the kinds of innovations for sustainability that are cropping up all around the world in different localities, different ways of organizing economies, of organizing energy, of organizing services, often at the grassroots which need to be shared and we need to learn lessons from them. Um, and our third big challenge um, is around what we call building inclusive and secure societies. This is partly about building resilience against risks, whether they're from conflict, from pandemics, from economy, financial crises, climate crises. Doing that in a way that, that reflects and engages with people's diverse located experiences of what it's like to feel unsafe and insecure, um, and builds processes that include people. Um, but it also links to the work IDS has done over many, many years around inclusive approaches to development and the institutions that can lead those, whether that's in our work on governance, on participation, on power and popular politics. And again, we're seeing lots of opportunities to connect up with digital knowledge sharing, whether it's in humanitarian response and getting knowledge into the hands of practitioners and responders, whether it's in approaches to digital governance, the kinds of opportunities for citizen inclusion and voice that are opening up through social media, through digital platforms. But as the bulletin we published um, earlier this year on opening governance shows, 
it's not all a happy story. There are also ways in which digital means of governance can close down and exclude certain voices, and they don't necessarily um, include in, a, in an even-handed way. So those are some of the broader digital questions we're thinking about. We're doing that in a way that takes this approach we're calling engaged excellence across all our work, the research and the knowledge sharing. And what we mean here is that the way we construct and mobilize knowledge and go about learning um, links to and depends on involving those at the heart of the change we want to see. Now that can mean involving communities, people at the grassroots, citizens, it can mean involving activist organizations, governments, but also a whole range of intermediaries. And I think some of those knowledge intermediaries um, are precisely um, the people who have a big role in this kind of engaged excellence work. We've also been thinking about four pillars, as we call them, that, that connect together, and they all depend on each other. So pull one away and they all, all, they all fall down. And we think that, that digital knowledge sharing is actually core to all of these. Um, so just briefly to say something about that, our first pillar is about high quality research. Um, increasingly, we're seeing digital research opportunities, whether it's in data collection through crowdsourcing, whether it's in data sharing through open data, the use of big data, or through the kinds of online dialogues which can actually generate new kinds of data. Um, as absolutely core to our research work and to the kinds of methods that we're, we're using. Um, but the second big pillar is about co-constructing knowledge um, with users, with actors in, in, in society. And we've been doing this for a long time and um, the knowledge sharing work of Elvis and others relating to Alan's point about actually now connecting with the creation of knowledge as well as just sharing it is, I think, part of this opportunity. And one just quite innovative example, which I really like, so I talk about it a lot, is some work we did last year using innovative digital music and YouTube um, formulae, connecting up with social media, to share young people's perspectives about um, questions of love and sex and their relationships with each other. And this all happened in Kenya. But it was a really nice example of taking some perspectives and using quite innovative digital media, multimedia, to enable people to have voice and then generate dialogues that could feed back to shape what decision makers were doing, but also what puppets were, were doing. Um, our second pillar about kind of mobilizing evidence for impact, I think we've been learning that there are roles both for that kind of longer term sharing um, of the kind that Elvis and others have been involved with, which can actually build up bodies of understanding about localities, about context, about issues, but also to be able to mobilize those very rapidly when they're needed to feed into action, emergencies, rapid needs. And an example there was how we were all, um, a number of us, were drawn into the Ebola crisis in West Africa, 2014-15, partly because it was a region of the world where we had long-term partnerships with researchers and actually had some access to knowledge about the social and cultural conditions that were shaping the transmission of disease, why people were resisting health workers' um, actions, things like burials and caring for the sick that were needed to be dealt with in that response. And using some of the knowledge platforms here, we were able very quickly to set up a response platform, which then brought that knowledge and, and local contextual knowledge and put it into the hands of, of decision makers, both humanitarian agencies <coughs> on the ground, field operators, but also some of the international agencies designing the response. Um, and this was an activity that actually just won the ESRC's Celebrating International Impact Award. And this kind of rapid response platform idea is now of great interest, I think, to a number of different agencies. So we're working out how to take it forward, perhaps for other issues and contexts. Um, we also, as one knows, I mean, I don't need to tell this group this, are, are very focused on mobilizing knowledge, whether it's long-term or short-term, with technologies. And I won't say more about, about this, except that I think 
that connection with inclusivity and building inclusive and secure societies fits very well with the long-term aim which is of elders and others, which has been about bringing more marginalised voices and perspectives into debates, relates to what Alan was saying about local context, finding ways for the voices one wouldn't necessarily hear um, to, to, to be at the table where decisions are being made. And we do all of this through networks of global partners. So my final slide um, is really just a bit of a, a, bit of a call, call to action. Um, my sense at the moment is developments at a little bit of a crossroads. On the one hand, the challenges are huge and they require transformative thinking and transformative action to be able to deliver on things like tackling inequalities, tackling unsustainability, building societies that can, that can be resilient to conflict and, and so on. And this is going to involve alliances, it's going to need connections of many sorts between people in different, in different places. It's also going to need, as it were, some opening up of political space for those, as it were, transformational views at a time when we can see often quite right-wing politics, a closure around national interests, a closure around much more narrow values in, in, a, in a complicated world. I think there is a role for knowledge sharing and for careful use of digital knowledge sharing actually in a bit of a mobilization effort which is about the politics of transformation um, it needs to go along with the democratization of knowledge and actually a democratization of perspectives and and advocacy which i think can help garner some of the the public support and, and a broader sense of alliance which is pushing in directions which are about opening up and moving the world globally and locally um, in important directions and countering some of these forces that at the moment are closing down towards much more nationalistic and individualistic kinds of interests. So, so the challenges are big, let's work together on this. has already been said by, by James, it's, it's a moment of anniversaries this, this year and we've been thinking about those for IDS more broadly and I see this anniversary moment like the bigger one we've been dealing with for IDS as a chance to look back, to look forward into a new era. Thank you.